SD Bullion has just launched Survival Food, headlined by the only 100% organic, GMO free survival food. Prepare like the doc, purchase your survival food from SD Bullion today. The Silver Bullet Silver Shield proudly introduces the new 2 ounce Freedom Girl. She's bigger, bolder, and beautiful, and available at sdbullion.com. SD Bullion. Metals and Markets is sponsored by DNA Precious Metals, a near-term producer of the Montauban Tailings Mine in Quebec, Canada. DNA Precious Metals trades on the OTC BB market under the symbol DNAP. This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets. Joining us this evening is special returning guest, uh, host Alistair McLeod. It's great to have you back, Alistair. Great to be on the show. Thank you. We had a big rally today in both gold and silver, particularly after the overnight smackdown in silver. Gold popping back above 13.55 um, late in the session today and hanging on to uh, nearly all of its gains in the access market, uh, closing above 13.50 in the access market, uh, just around 13.53. Silver up quite a bit from the overnight uh, smash down, well, I guess overnight into the COMEX open um, around 8 a.m. Eastern, smash down towards 22 and up nicely off that, again, also closing above uh, 22.50 today. So both metals had a, a good Friday recovering, and uh, it's pretty interesting if you look at uh, like the weekly chart or the, the daily chart, the algos have been rearing their heads, and the pattern throughout the week, uh, if you overlap uh, the daily charts uh, for the last few days has been nearly identical throughout the week other than a, a few big smashes so the algos have been back but uh, what are your guys thoughts about uh, the market and where we're headed here i know Go gofo has remained negative throughout uh, the week really since the day that the u.s budget deficit crisis was resolved seems to be an indication that uh, the need to suppress gold by leasing it onto the market is over now um, and the, the gold market seems to be uh, getting tight again at least from GoFo perspective. So I guess we'll start with Alistair. What's your thoughts on gold and silver, the market here, and uh, the GoFo rate? Well, I think it's very positive. I mean, we saw uh, gold and silver hit a low, a low, the low price, post-high um, low price. Uh, I think it was on the 26th or 27th of June. It then bounced quite strongly from there, and uh, it sort of dribbled off and got into a little bit of a downtrend. And uh, there was no doubt in my mind that uh, there were various vested interests that wanted to drive the market below that uh, end June low. And they have failed. And not only have they failed, but gold has broken that, that uh, downtrend and formed a new bottom. Silver has sort of ended in what looks like a, a diagonal triangle, which um, is indicative of a, a loss of downside momentum. Uh, and uh, it's, it's broken up quite sharply out of that. And I know it consolidated a bit today. But both, I think both gold and silver are looking technically very good. Now, the key point in this is that we now have two bottoms. We had the bottom back in, uh, in, in June, and we had a bottom uh, um, about a week ago, a bit over a week ago. The effect of that is that if you get two rising lows as it low points, then by definition, you are in a new bull trend. Now, how long it lasts is a question. But I think this is the first time we've been able to say something positive for some considerable time. Yeah, and that's also happening on the backdrop of enormous buying out of Asia, particularly in China. You know, we had the reportage of uh, just shy of 300 metric tons being purchased uh, in China for August through the Hong Kong importation window. Uh, it's actually kind of funny, too, because uh, Sprott, Eric Sprott had uh, written that open letter to the Gold Council about a week or so ago uh, talking about how their uh, methodologies for uh, computing what imports for China in particular are, are just uh, leaving much to be desired. World Gold Council responded to Sprott and uh, had published this through uh, a Barron's blog posting. And I'd like to quote just this one simple paragraph because it's rather amusing. The use of import data as a proxy to measure gold demand is somewhat simplistic and does not take into account factors such as round tripping and stocking destocking. To effectively measure gold demand, a more detailed and holistic analysis is required. 
And believe it or not, folks, that was the most substantive point that they offered in rebuttal to Eric Sprott's very well thought out <laughs> letter to the Gold Council. So, uh, and it, it just goes to show that basically they continue to just knock on the door of the Chinese uh, central bank and say, please tell us how much gold you're importing. Oh, you don't have any news for us? Well, well I guess we'll just stick with our estimate of 1,050 metric tons. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it, it, these numbers are a farce. I mean, the fact of the matter is that you've got two wonderful data points for China. You've got the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which, uh, where gold trades at a premium to uh, a spot in London, and therefore nobody's going to go in there, buy gold, take delivery with a view to punting it out later on. No, it's a physical delivery market, and it goes uh, either into Hong Kong for fabrication, but the majority of it goes into China and is distributed. And the second data point, of course, is Hong Kong itself. And what you can do very easily, and I mean, you don't have to be a very smart analyst to do this, is you can separate out exports and re-exports to get an idea as to how much of it is going, let's say, uh, through Hong Kong uh, and being sold uh, into the um, uh, the Shanghai Gold Exchange, maybe refabricated into one kilogram bars. Uh, so, you know, I mean, the numbers are there. And the amazing thing is that uh, this year's uh, supply through those two centers on a net basis gives us uh, an annualized minimum of 2,600 tons per annum this year. Now, if you look at world gold mine production, uh, it's estimated, I think, generally at around about 2,700 tons. China herself is 440 tons. None of that comes on the market. And I can verify that because I spoke to a refiner from Switzerland uh, and asked him the very question. He said, do you ever see any Chinese bars? And he said, no, never. So all the Chinese uh, mine supply is actually snaffled up by the government. It doesn't go through the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and it certainly is not exported through Hong Kong. So we are looking at an annualized demand of 2,600 tons and a non-China annual mine supply of 2,260 tons. In other words, they, China alone is taking more gold than the rest of the world can supply. I mean, this is this is really quite extraordinary, and I think it's uh, very remiss that the World Gold Council just you know doesn't uh, seem to be um, any degree of urgency in terms of getting on top of these figures. I mean, they're absolutely fundamental to what is going on. Well, they basically uh, have dug themselves into a hole over the past decade plus because of they're underreported consistently of China's numbers. And when China came out, I believe it was in 2006, and said. Guess what, folks? We are now at 1,050 metric tons, uh, having you know, increased over the course of the three- or four-year period, um, more than doubling what they had officially said before. And the Gold Council, all the while, all, and through those years, never reported a single ounce being added into China's uh, numbers. So, you know, the methodology yeah. speaks for itself. It's, it's defunct. <laughs> it has problems. I couldn't agree more. And that's even before we talk about Thailand. Thailand this year yeah. is on course for 410 tons. So much so that Thailand is thinking of setting up its own gold exchange. We now lose track of the figures in India because they've decided to make life difficult for the importers. Um, I mean, some sort of semblance of normality appears, we hope, to be returning ahead of Diwali. But, um, you know, I mean, the way India works is quite simple. You know, you just got to bribe a few people and you've got your route in. <laughs> and it just disappears from, the, from uh, government statistics. So the idea that... Um, India is now no longer importing what she was importing earlier this year is, is, is a complete fallacy. And I am sure that actually the reason that the Reserve Bank produced the new rules is I think they were lent on through the Bank of International Settlements by the, uh, probably the Bank of England and probably the Fed because they know how much of this gold is just disappearing into Asia. They were horrified when they banged the price back in April demand just took off the Richter scale. Uh, and now what they're trying to do is they're trying to um, close down the problem by telling the Indians, look, for goodness sake, um, stop these gold imports. They, I mean, if they said that try, to, to China, China would smile sweetly and do nothing. <laughs> I think that's as simple as that. So there's a lot of geopolitics in this. Yeah, well, and India also had the incentive vis-a-vis -vis their uh, balance of payments uh, issues that are not as 
such in China, so India was easier to push around because their politicians were more attuned to protecting that issue. But I'd like to throw a little bit more weight on uh, Alastair's claims about the Western Central Bank's influencing India's uh, monetary policy decisions regarding gold. A lot of people have forgotten the story. It's been just over a year ago in early October of 2012. Timothy Geithner and Ben Bernanke took a trip to India and uh, regarding uh, the financial ties. And uh, I think that was, well, obviously there's other things uh, discussed as well. I think one of the number one items on the agenda was likely you need to do something about your citizens' uh, gold demand here. We have a problem, and we, we can't have them be uh, draining all the, the gold off the market like they are. Uh, you need to get your act together. Because it really wasn't too much longer after that that we started to see changes from uh, India. Yeah, that's interesting. And um, I, it makes an awful lot of sense. I mean, India has not only tried to uh, you know, fiddle with um, import duties and taxes and all the rest of it, um, but, you know, they've also tried to persuade their citizens to, uh, you know, lend the gold to uh, the central bank and, um, you know, set up gold funds, submit their gold in return for an investment in the gold fund. They've been... Um, uh, sending letters out to the various temples and saying, you know, can you please let us know how much gold you've got? You know, we don't really, no, no, it's all right. We're just, um, we're just asking. I mean, you know, I think um, in some cases uh, the temples have complied. In other cases, um, the temples have said, you can go and take a running jump. <laughs> so, right. I mean, they, 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 there is no doubt that, I mean, the desperation to me uh, is is as a result of them being lent on because I hear the ex I, you know I hear the excuse which is made all the time that uh, the reason there is a huge great trade deficit in India is because of all the gold that's being imported. I mean, that's a load of absolute rubbish. I mean, basically, basically, people are saving, and that's what it is, and the gold is going in there, and and uh, you've got to look at it if you like as a sort of you know as a capital account rather than anything else. Yeah, it's too bad that they are beholden to the Bank of International Settlements and Western you know, banking perspective, because if they were to just simply declare it as a capital account issue well, and an asset, it's not like they're importing it oil and burning it, and therefore it does not exist. It's actually stored that value that enriches the country. But CLB, that's the way it is. Yeah, precisely. But they're probably going to import, uh, all told, at least the... Uh, a thousand metric tons this year. I think that uh, the current estimates are still in the neighborhood of 800 metric tons, and I suspect that we're going to be surprised that it's going to be well north of a thousand metric tons. In fact, it may even be a record here, given all the smuggling. You know, so uh, it remains to be seen. You know, when you combine that with Thailand and China and and let's not forget uh, Russia, Malaysia and Russia, and <laughs> Russia, you know, Russia's tripled their. Um Official reserves, I think, since 2006 or 2007, so that's just their official numbers. What, what Eric was, brought was kicking around the numbers in the 5,000 metric tons area for annual consumption this year. So you know, at, at some point, price has got to give because you know, the central banks don't have enough to, to, to meet that demand. And paper yeah, it's, games it's, only go so far. That's interesting. I mean, I... Um, I uh, interviewed uh, uh, a director of one of the large Swiss um, refiners uh, earlier this this week, and I was trying to find out uh, to what you know, so how much of this gold is left in the West, and he couldn't really say, and he was reluctant, I think, to say something that might be misinterpreted, but. What these refiners like is they like the more recent bars because apparently the standard of the re more recent uh, LBMA bars is closer to four nines. That's, uh, you know, nine, 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 nine out of 10,000, um, which is the standard that the Chinese want in their one kilogram bars. Because what these, these um, refiners in Switzerland are doing is they're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, meeting Chinese demand for one kilogram, four nines bars. The minimum standard for an LBMA bar is 995, which is quite a lot less. So what they have to do is they have to take those, melt them down, refine them, and then recast them. And that process takes longer. So most of the time they've been getting the sort of slightly better quality uh, bars, but uh, they are beginning to see, apparently, some of the older bars that look as if they've been sort of stashed in a corner for quite a long time. Now that suggests to me, I'm probably reading too much into this, so I would, I would say that uh, <laughs> you know, as, a, 
if you like, as a sort of uh, caveat. Um, caveat. But it sort of, I can just imagine that, uh, you know, they, <laughs> they're getting to the edge of the vault and there's not a lot left <laughs> except the old stuff that just hasn't been shifted for, for decades. I, I remember a couple years back, I think it was about 2010, there were stories of uh, 0. 0.900 gold showing up, which is U.S. coin melt. <laughs> 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 I don't know how long that was going on, but uh, there was some refining of uh, you know, some of the more deeper stored gold in the United States, for sure. Yeah, well, I think this, th these standards, I, I'm not sure how long the LBMA has been going, but I think, I think these standards probably date from the 80s rather than earlier. Yeah. So if you've got anything earlier than that, then it's, it's not going to be LBMA standard necessarily. Now, Alistair, uh, with you speaking with the Swiss refiner, we've had some anecdotal reports from some of the, the metals dealers uh, across Europe that a lot of the refiners are reporting a shortage of the physical silver, um, claiming kind of like you just alluded to with um, the refiners pumping out 24-7 production for the, the Chinese one kilo bars. They're doing the same with silver. Did the, the Swiss refiner have any uh, insight regards to silver? Um, well, there is the, there is big demand there, but I think when it comes to silver, um, he tends to do less silver. Silver in Europe is not quite so easy because you've got um, what we call value-added tax, and in Switzerland there's a there's also a general sales tax of eight percent. So you can't move anything out of a vault without having to declare it for tax, and there are all sorts of um, you know sort of problems there which are not insuperable and certainly they can uh, recast for non-European markets but our conversation really centered more on gold uh, but I you know I've one hears uh, stories I haven't uh, been able to check this out myself through lack of time more than anything else that uh, uh, silver demand in India for example has really taken off uh, partly one guess is because of the premiums that have arisen on gold because of the restrictions I want to shift the topic a little bit here um, to discuss um, the QE eternity or QE forever, whatever you want to call it here in the U.S. And uh, the euro is rising against the dollar recently here. And uh, as we were discussing a little bit before the show with Eric, uh, he was pointing out that the the European Union has been uh, one of the, the holdouts as far as uh, the easiest of monetary policies. What are your thoughts, Alistair? Um, rather than a Fed taper, I think uh, you originally called that there wasn't going to be any taper. Um, call that proved spot on. Um, there's now been a couple of banks, I think, uh, starting to call that as soon as uh, the next FOMC meeting, they may increase QE. W what's your thoughts on the ECB? Is are, Will they be uh, moving in the next, say, 6 to 12 months to um, kind of follow the likes of the Bank of Japan and the Fed as far as uh, the monetary spigots? I think the ECB has got a, um, a bit of a problem there because the Germans do not like the idea of printing money at all. The ECB has a very firm charter that restricts its room for maneuver in this respect. Uh, and so far what they've done is they've just basically made noises and um, the market, if you like, has responded positively. And I guess that a lot of the uh, support in terms of liquidity that the market needs has probably come through the foreign branches of Eurozone banks dipping into the excess reserve part of the Fed. So, again, I don't have breakdowns of figures or anything, but people I respect say that the foreign banks are big, big lenders to the Fed, if you like. I mean, they've got yeah. large deposits in the form of excess reserves. And uh, I think... as much as a third of right. coming from the Fed. Right. Well, in, and I think, I think that probably um, is, is part of the answer. I would also question that the euro is going up against the dollar. I think it's probably more accurate to say the dollar is going down against the euro. But anyway, that's a semantic point. Right. <laughs> uh, as far as QE in the States is concerned, I think we have to be aware that uh, the growth in cash and deposits, if you include the deposits that the bank have at the Fed. And the reason I do that is I just try and compare sound money, gold, that is, with fiat currency. And I've come up with a new metric, which uh, we've called the fiat money quantity. Um, and it reverses the process whereby gold, first of all, went into the banks. And then when central banks were invented, it went from the banks and into the, the, um, uh, the central banks. So if you reverse that, you, you end up with uh, this 
fiat money quantity. Now, I have to say that um, between 1960 and uh, June, sorry, July 2008, just before uh, Lehman Brothers fell over, the growth rate of that was a compound 5.9% uh, per annum. Uh, now we have a situation where, uh, because of, first of all, TARP and so on and so forth and the various uh, quantitative easing programs, that has taken off above that hyperbolic trend, sorry, the parabolic trend, has now gone hyper. And we are over 60% above that long-established trend. So FMQ is in hyperinflation. Now, the implication of that is if you slow down the rate at which you uh, make liquidity in the form of deposit money in, uh, available uh, to the economy, then you're going to start creating huge, huge, great problems, particularly amongst the banks, uh, amongst the over-indebted, and you're going to have interest rates rising on you very, very quickly. And indeed, I mean, all we had was the threat of tapering uh, and look what happened to uh, to Treasury yields. I mean, they, they, they went up very steeply. And not only that, but that destabilized the rest of the world. So, and that was just the mention of it. And uh, they backed off very quickly from that. And that was still, I, that was still um, 85 billion a month or a thousand dollars a year in, in uh, quantitative 80, easing. That's 85 billion and up. So my conclusion on this is not only will they continue with 85 billion a month, but I think that they are going to have to increase the rate if they're going to keep control over interest rates as they have stated they desire to do. Uh, if they're going to keep interest rates at, at, at current close to zero levels and keep some control over the yield curve, then they are going to have to accelerate the rate of money uh, uh, or the, uh, liquidity injection through, through, through extra money. And I think uh, Mark Farber uh, picked up on this point and you know, he said, oh, it's going to go to a trillion or something. Um, I think it was a slightly flip comment, but he's in the right direction. And I think that this is something which uh, the gold market or the gold bears, I think, are going to begin to realize in the coming weeks more and more. And that's something so, that almost can quickly turn into uh, or spiral into a negative feedback cycle, whereas the market starts to realize that the Fed is going to need to, to increase greatly the uh, quantity of QE. Suddenly, the prospects of holding a 30-year bond are, might not be so appealing. And uh, as they start to back away from their holdings of purchases or allocate to other assets, um, even reduce their positions somewhat or their, their allocations, um, it's sort of a negative feedback cycle that the Fed has to again increase uh, to offset the uh, the selling or e at least um, less buying. Yes, I agree with that. Um, I, I think what it boils down to is that the market will uh, believe that investing in treasuries is okay so long as they think the Fed is controlling the market and can, can continue to control the market. I mean, one of the things that the Fed has to do is it has to supply... Um, uh, treasuries, if you like, or cause treasuries to be supplied to the government at very low interest cost. Uh, the market wouldn't, wouldn't fund the US government's deficit at anything like current levels if it wasn't for the fact that the Fed is doing it through QE. And that's a very important point, as well as obviously the liquidity point. If you get a rise in 10-year um, you know, bonds, even 5-year bonds of, say, 1% or 2%, then this is going to create huge difficulties for the banks because uh, falling um, uh, bond prices start wiping out capital. Now, I know that they can play accounting tricks and all the rest of it, but think what happens to, let's say, a Spanish bank or a French bank or an Italian bank. Because if you get start getting interest rates rising in the United States, then I am pretty certain they'll start rising at at least double the rate in some of those weaker Eurozone countries. And that, I think, is where the weakness in the global banking system really lies. So uh, we'll look for the interest rates and keep an eye on that, as well as uh, look for QE to increase rather than taper here. Yeah, and we, we need to even lay on another dynamic on top of all of that that fits perfectly over, and that's the uh, chipping away of the U.S. dollar reserve status and trade status, particularly as it uh, translates through the petroleum markets. I mean, it was a bit over a month ago that China and Russia announced bilateral agreement to uh, have China purchase Russian oil with, with Chinese yuan. 
Saudi Arabians right now are making noises of displeasure about how the United States is not doing their bidding when it comes to foreign policy vis-a-vis Syria. And uh, this is not something that's going to go away. It's going to continue to be, for lack of a better term, and sorry for the pun, but a Chinese water torture against the U.S. dollar as a reserve status because uh, it's, it's in China's best interest to diversify away from its large hoard of U.S. dollars and move the world more towards some kind of an alternative, and that process is going to continue on through 2014. And as less and less dollars are needed to purchase oil and other goods and services in the global economy, the demand for dollars will decline, the need for the storage of uh, reserves within the treasury instruments at central banks of nations around the world, et cetera, et cetera, will decline. And uh, those dollars will come home, and that'll be a force of inflation in the U.S. domestic economy, and who knows, maybe that might be the trigger that ends up uh, resuscitating the bond vigilantes in the United States, and then uh, it'll be a war between the Federal Reserve, uh, serving as the buyer of last resort, keeping interest rates on the long end down, versus inflation expectations rising. And that is not a battle that portends well for for any financial asset other than gold. (laughs) Yeah, and no, I, I agree. Sorry. I was just going to say, I think it's safe to say as well that um, among the gold community, it's pretty widely accepted that China's official um, gold reserves are very low. I think in that same aspect, it's quite likely that their official treasury holdings are not what they actually hold anymore. They've they've been uh, throughout to various means, whether it's um, physical assets and mining firms and base metals, precious metals throughout the world, as well as even um, the precious metals, uh, gold and silver, um, obtained through other mechanisms outside of, um, say, Hong Kong or Shanghai. That's not the, uh, definitely not the only, not not the only gold going into China is through Hong Kong. When it comes to the United States, we do have reasonable data when it comes to who's buying what. When it comes to our bonds, the the Treasury reports that on a month or on a quarterly basis, the tick report, um, and there's been a pretty consistent pattern with the exception of Japan about two months ago stepping up to the plate and buying a ton of bonds right about the time when Bernanke was getting ready to do his flip-flop on tapering uh, in concern of the fact that you know, the 10-year had just touched 3% and then everybody in the Fed kind of panicked and reversed on tapering. But all in all, the, the pattern has been that worldwide um, there's been uh, a pretty noticeable shift in interest in buying U.S. bonds and and, and the demand is just not there. So once again, the Fed is acting as the buyer of last resort. I think. I, th- I think. Sorry, if I can interject. I think the Chinese are, are, are realists um, with respect to uh, the dollar and their uh, treasury holdings. Um, I would not be surprised if uh, they're prepared to write that off, uh, given their analysis of where the situation is. They know they can't really access those treasuries. They can't really sell them. I mean, they can let them, uh, you know, sort of quietly redeem as they, as, as they become due. Um, but that's about it. And I think that here again, gold is central, and you've got this um, uh, dichotomy between the West and the East. Um, you know, Bernanke says he just doesn't understand gold. <laughs> and I think the reason he doesn't understand gold is that when they smashed the price, he expected everybody to turn bearish. Instead, those pesky Asians go and buy it. Um, uh, I think that was the bit he didn't actually understand. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> no, 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 I don't, no, no, I think that was, a, I, funnily enough, uh, I think it was a genuine comment. I think he <laughs> really was surprised by what happened. Yeah. Um, it would explain their actions in the first place, because otherwise, I mean, you know, if you actually had half a handle on what they were doing, you'd say, well, why give it to them so cheaply? <laughs> <laughs> um, instead, they took the other view. Anyway, um, uh, I think that um, what China's view on this is, that, is that, the, the, the dollar is basically following policies which will lead to the dollar's destruction. They do not want to get caught in that. They see an awful lot of risk, I think, in other people's currencies. And I think this is why, uh, very quietly, they are accumulating gold. They're not only accumulating their own production, but I suspect they're also maybe taking a bit more out of the market if and when it's available. 
On top of that, they're encouraging their citizens to take gold. I mean, I, I haven't been to China, but I'm told by people who have that the state-sponsored adverts on the television saying, you know, go out and buy gold. <laughs> so um, they are actively encouraging this. Um, and I, I, I think that if you can imagine a time when the dollar is in real trouble, the uh, consequences for every nation, I think, will be really quite uh, appalling. China, I think, can see that there is a good likelihood this would happen. They have something like 42 different ethnic groups to hold together. Uh, they are very keen that they don't want those ethnic groups, you know, taking it out on each other. You've got a recipe for civil war if you don't have a strong central authority at the top. And I think that um, uh, they are taking the view that if um, people actually have gold, uh, they are less likely to fight than if they fight each other than if they don't have gold. And if you think about it, that's actually quite a sensible uh, approach to um, uh, trying to control that that ethnic risk, if you like. And so I think the Chinese are really being very, very uh, sensible about this. I mean, they don't want to upset the global apple cart. But it's got to the state where um, a bit over a week ago, there was an op-ed in, uh, uh, in, in the state um, press organ saying that, you know, the way the dollar is going is going to be no longer fit for purpose as a reserve currency and they're looking for a replacement. I don't think they will look to do to put forward their own currency as a replacement, by the way. But coincidentally, uh, that week, that very week, our Chancellor George Osborne gets on a plane unscheduled um, and joins uh, the mayor of London's Boris Johnson's uh, trade mission and goes and meets all the bigwigs in China. And then he comes back with all these deals. And I think behind it is quite simply, the Chinese have decided that their future settlement needs are going to have to involve their own currency. And so they want to rapidly develop the markets that you need, the liquidity, the depth of liquidity you need, you know, so, so um, you know, futures markets and, um, uh, and forward markets and all the rest of it, you know, the, the real depth of currency uh, markets. And they're going for a twin nexus between Hong Kong and London, cutting out America completely. Right. And I find that fascinating. I really do find that fascinating. And I think there is a very big geopolitical game here with China trying to avoid uh, the obvious risks of the future, which, of course, the Fed can't admit to. And I have to say, I think, the, I think um, if, if I may <laughs> say this against the Americans, I think they're being very handed, heavy handed in the way they're dealing with these issues. And just, sorry, just one last thought um, on the currency. Uh, I think this business of uh, the NSA uh, bugging um, Western leaders' telephones is actually a very, very serious issue. And I think that um, it's likely to do enormous damage to the brand that is the dollar. Um, I know it's, it doesn't make any sense from an economic point of view, but given that there are so many dollars out there, uh, outside America, I just, I just think that it's, it's not a clever idea to get caught snooping on your friends. Yeah, and, and from an international relations um, theory point of view, there's basically three pillars to international relations power, geostrategic power, military, economic, and moral authority. When it comes to moral authority, we're squandering that in the United States at record pace, and the NSA issue is feeding right into that. And, and when it comes to the military power, our economic uh, ability to fund our military presence in, what, 170 countries around the world, and God knows how many bases we have, probably over 800 at this point worldwide. I mean, that, that it, it's an empire excess that requires a strong um, economic position, and uh, the dollar as a reserve currency feeds into that. And, and this whole edifice is very weak and strained, and you can see it in our domestic politics even when it comes to how it translates in, in, in the American political system and the debates that we had about Syria and so forth. So I think we more so now than at any time in the last decade, we have uh, conditions for a considerable amount of uh, change that could happen very quickly at any given catalyst. So, and I suspect 2014 is probably going to see a number of those black swans surfacing. So that will be interesting to watch. All right.
So we have uh, silver moving up uh, strongly here to close the week. Uh, gold as well. Gold looking like um, it has put in a, a second bottom, uh, confirming the early bottom, uh, end of June, early July. Around, uh, I think, 1179 was the bottom there. More evidence that uh, China just uh, continues to accumulate as many physical ounces as they can. Um, GoFo again, now negative for about a week and a half since the, the U.S., uh, fiscal crisis, so it's can caked for another three months. Alistair, always great to have you back. I really appreciate you joining us again. It's great to have you. That's been very much my pleasure. All right, uh, we'll wrap things up there for this week. So for the Doc and Eric Dubin and uh, Alistair McLeod, thanks for tuning in to the SD Weekly Metals and Markets. SD Bullion.